welcome. Let's have everybody get quiet and centered. We have such a special treat. I just came from the George Nuri luncheon. Was anyone else over there just now? Show of hands. Something extraordinary happened at the luncheon. Um, uh, we were over there and Eric von Daniken received a Lifetime uh, Achievement Award and got a standing ovation. So why don't we do it again here? Stand up. Woo! <laughs> and it was so beautiful. Everyone sit down. And I heard, I heard from some of the, the participants here that they were at a panel and they all sang happy birthday because he just celebrated his 80th birthday. So that's a wonderful thing. So as you all know, I know I'm preaching to the choir. Eric Von Daniken is the world's most successful nonfiction writer of all time. He's, he's written 38 books and e-media and he's sold over 63 million copies of his books worldwide and they've been translated into 32 languages and of course you all know that in the United States he won instant fame as a result of the television special in search of ancient astronauts based on his first book chariots of the gods without further ado please welcome Eric von Daniken okay no well, no so, okay, good afternoon and welcome, ladies and gentlemen. As you hear it from my accent, I'm Swiss, and uh, sometimes I might have problems to express myself in English, but of course you will understand everything and you will help me. So, it all started thousands and thousands of years ago, and the Sumerians had their first writings. That's how Sumerian writing look like so-called cuneiforms on this planet there are probably about 25 professors doctors who are able to translate this mixture here of lines and one of them is a specialist with the name of Dr. Hermann Burgard he's a German you don't know his name and uh, this Dr. Hermann Burgard for the first time, retranslated old Sumerian cuneiforms. What means retranslated? The old translations of these texts are always made in a psychological way. We always thought it has to do with religion, or with storm, or with wind, and so on. And now we have a new thought, you have a new way of thinking. And now we have new translations of the old texts. Bring this card. Of, unfortunately, only in German, 4,300 years ago, lived the Sumerian, in the Sumerian city of Nippur, a lady with the name of Encheduana. That's the name here, Encheduana. She was the highest priest and the daughter of a Sumerian king. Therefore, she was able to write. And she wrote 80 Sumerian tablets, which our archaeologists today named the holy hymnus of Encheduana. Finally, these old texts were translated, as I said before, by the Sumerolog Sumerologist Dr. Hermann Burgard. And this specialist, one of the few who is able to translate Sumerian cuneiform, was absolutely fascinated by the writings of Encheduana. She definitely writes about so-called Ding gears, and these are flying machines comparable to the Vimanas in ancient India, the flying chariot in the Ethiopian book Kebra Negest, where King Solomon flies around the world, or the spaceship of Ezekiel in the Bible. Forty years ago, the Sumerolo Sumerologists believed that the writings of Encheduana has to do with some sort of folklore of the gods, or with the moon, or the sun, or the lightning in the clouds, or the thundering. Dr. Burgard clearly, and without any doubts, translated the hymns of Encheduana as modern technology. She was in reality writing about real space stations in orbit, about machines coming down from these stations. And here on Earth, these flying machines 
we today would call them space shuttles, were refueled with the mixture of different oils and carbid, carbide, carbid. It's a similar composition of liquids and carbid as we find them in old Indian texts. What do you see here while I'm talking? Are just Sumerian tablets. Watch how these gods are represented. And most of them always have something like a watch around their arms. So, Enchedwana, this priest, also writes about the terrible noise which these flying machines made. Comparable again to Ezekiel in the Bible. She compares the noise with the thundering of a waterfall. Finally, Enchedwana made clear that the humans were some sorts of slaves of the gods, except of the chosen people, the chosen one. And these were the group of humans which stand under the command of the highest. The king and the people all worked for the gods. In return, the gods helped the chosen ones against their enemies. Now, you see these Sumerian gods are represented here. And in ancient archaeology, it is said these gods are working for the tree of life. But with modern eyes, it's not a tree of life. You all know what DNA is. What DNA is. In fact, they change the code of DNA. And this is represented in old tablets. Now, these gods helped the chosen people against their enemies. And this, again, we can demonstrate in old pictures. You know, I have that false gemacht. Aha. Before I show this, just look at these Sumerian seals. You always see these flying gods. By the way, this has not been translated. We don't know what it is. That's Sumerian. They're flying machines in the clouds. The gods here, again changing the, chair, the DNA. This is all Sumerian. Ships in the sky with beings in there. What's going next? Uh, für was? Weiß nicht. Weiß nicht. Okay, gang zurück auf Edfu. So. There is in Egypt is a temple called the Temple of Edfu. And in the Temple of Edfu, that's it, there is a temple wall. This time, of course, not with Sumerian writings. These are Egyptian hieroglyphs. And here, again, in the Temple of Edfu, they tell us the story that the gods from the sky, the winged sun gods, helped the humans, at least the humans of the chosen ones, against their enemy. And in the Bible, we have the same thing. In the Bible, you can read, uh, wait, in the second book of the Kings, chapter 19, verse 35, and the angel came down from the heaven and killed 185,000 Assyrians. On the next morning, there were only dead bodies on the ground. In both cases, at the temple of Edfu and in the second book of the kings, it's the same story. Just from different sources. But they all speak about the same thing. We even have Sumerian pictures where we see these fighting gods descending in their sun wing to the sky and fighting against humans. This is the moment where I want to ask heaven. They were coming from heaven. What is heaven? When I was a boy, they told me heaven is the place of happiness after death, a place where we are united with God. But even in our Christian Jewish tradition, it all started with a war in heaven. Do you remember the story of the archangel Lucifer? He went to the throne of the almighty God and said, we don't serve you anymore. Then God ordered the archangel Michael to fight against Lucifer and to throw him out 
him and his disciples out of heaven. But uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you are in a place of absolute happiness in heaven, you are near to God, an opposition or a fight is impossible. Or you are happy or you fight. You cannot have both together. So it was not a fight in heaven. It was a fight in space. We must change the word heaven into the word space. Why? Because many of our ancestors were brought into the heavens. Not only Arjuna from the Indian mythology, but also the biblical Elijah, Enoch, I will come to him later, or our primogenitor Abraham. All these figures were educated in heaven, and then they return safe to earth. So heaven was space. The same is true for words like angels. What is an angel? In cave and rock paintings, the angels are represented with halos or helmets around their heads, and of course with wings, like we have some pictures of the so-called angels. But just threw the word angel out and write over it extraterrestrial. So you change the whole pictures. Heaven was space. Angels were extraterrestrials. And so on. You only have to change ten words of ancient texts. And you came to a complete new rela rel relation. You see it completely different. Psychology or the religious looking of it was wrong. That was the past. Do not forget, when our clever professors translated these holy books for the first time, 200, 600 years ago, they had no idea of space travel. They had no idea of flights, of aircraft, or things like this. So they all believed it has to do with God. It has to do with angels. It had nothing to do with the real God, and nothing to do with the real angel. It had to do with space. And with fighting. By doing so, by thinking so, you never lose your God. I'm often accus accusated by critics who say, well, Eric, if you think like this, you must be an atheist. No. Just think for maybe one minute that I'm on the right side. That would mean we were visited thousands of years ago by extraterrestrials. So the next question is, okay, where do they come from? What is their evolution? So you can say they were visited again by other extraterrestrials. All right, and the other extraterrestrials. They again were visited by other extraterrestrials, and so on. You can play back this game for hundreds and millions of years. Finally, you arrive on a starting point, where in every respect, with religion, you say, here is God. You never lose God. You never lose the concept of God. It's just changing the mind. The ones who were here some thousands of years ago were not God. Our ancestors, because they had no idea of technology, they believed that these extraterrestrials are gods. In reality, it has nothing to do with the great almighty God with the creation of the universe. This is the difference. Now, I have to tell you a story because it all is linked together with other stories, you will understand what I'm talking about during this speech. Here is the Great Pyramid, known to you. But what you don't know, what is inside this building, and what are the newest discoveries. First of all, this is the official entry of the Great Pyramid. This entry was never discovered. It's just a coincidence that today we have this entry, but some Thousands of years ago, they did not know something about this entry. Then inside the pyramid, you have to uh, climb up these 23 meters. So, these 23 meters, why is the upgoing uh, shaft. Then you come to uh, next, uh, the so-called Great Gallery. Now, this is nearly 8 meter high, 47 meters long. Absolutely incredible inside this building. From Vito. You see, this was the upcoming corridor, which we saw before. Then comes the great gallery here. Up here is the so-called king's chamber. Down is the smaller chamber, which they call queen's chamber. 
Don't forget, all these words, King's Chamber, Queen's Chamber, are just invasions of our generation. We don't know how the ancients call it. And under the pyramid is an unknown camera, unfinished chamber. And now it becomes interesting. We are now, <laughs> we are now inside the so-called Queen's Chamber. And you see this small hall here. We are in the, in the south side of the Queen's Chamber. And the same hall happens on the north side. So there are two holes in the wall. And now it's very, very important to understand these two holes, south and north, only exist since 170 years. Before 170 years, there were no holes on the wall. 170 years ago, a British man came to the pyramid and he had a little hammer and he knocked every two centimeters on the wall. And on two places, it sounded hollow. And only now, he, they took tools and opened these two uh, shafts here, on the south and on the, the, the north side. So before, there was nothing. Now, archaeologists claim that these are so-called air shafts. But I'm sorry, this is ridiculous, because these things were closed. <laughs> there, were no, there were no air inside. Now, 12 years ago, one of my friends, Rudolf Gantenbrink, he constructed a small robot. And you see the story of the robot now. It was composited of steel. He had lights, halogen lights. And he could move in every direction. You have to know that the hole, the shaft, is only 18 centimeters on one side. So no human could grab in there. You need robot, modern technology. So this robot had the name of Upoalt. And he went into the shaft. The official Egyptology always said the shaft is probably only eight meters long. And then he comes to a still end. But the robot inside the pyramid continued and continued climbing up. The eight meter limit was passed long time. And he just continued inside the Great Pyramid, going slowly up and up. The walls always changed. There were marble, there were alabaster, there were uh, granite, there was sandstone. From time to time, you have the impression as it looks like doors. If there were doors in antiquity, and this is thousands and thousands of years old, don't forget it. Then the robot found on the wall some uh, scratching. You will just see it. When you see these pictures, you have the impression, well, this is a big shaft. Someone, someone can climb in there. It's not the big shaft. It's just 18 centimeters on one side. It's nothing. The pictures look big. The pictures you see now are 12 years old. I show it because I want to show you the continuation. What happens since 12 years? What was going inside the Great Pyramid? And these things are not published by the Egyptologists. So the robot continue and continue. After 32 meters, there was a stone block in the shaft. And the stone blocked the continuation of the robot. So it took uh, a few weeks more. The robot had to be pulled back again and to make a, li a little smaller. He was too high. And then he passed this stone block too. This was 32 meters inside the pyramid. Now the robot continued, and after 62 meters inside the pyramid, the robot came to a standstill before something like a little door. And on this little door, there were two, uh, some sort of copper bracelets, bra bracelets. You see one here on the ground. The walls and the ceiling are Alabaster. Alabaster is like a way of marble. Now look at this red point down here. He goes under the door. So we knew that the door is not closed to the ground, that there was a little left behind the ground. So something must be here behind this door. Twelve years ago, time passed. 
Four years later, your American National Geographic Society constructed a new robot. And this new robot had a borer drilling. A drill. ha this new robot had the drill. Uh, with this drill, they made a hole here. And then they made a public international TV show, and the word life was always shown inside. They, it was all a lie. It was not life. <laughs> you see, with this drill, they made a hole. They told the world public for the first time they would pull a camera through this hole so that the world could see what's behind the door. But that was all a lie. It was not life. They made it a long time before, weeks before. So. Now, behind this first door, you see something like a stone wall. You have that first door with the hole, and 23 centimeters later, you have this, a second wall, who blocked again the continuation. So another robot was constructed. <laughs> That was two and a half years ago. And to this new robot, they give the name of Jedi. Jedi has a, huh? Jedi. Jedi. <laughs> Jedi has a double, <laughs> Jedi has a double meaning. Because Jedi on uh, Arabian means Cheops. But Jedi are the, the nouns of Jedi in the, the Star Wars uh, series. So it's a double meaning. So Jedi was a new robot and he made a small little hole into this wall, which you just saw before. Only big enough for an endoscope. With an endoscope, you cannot make big pictures. You make very small pictures, but you make hundreds of them. These were taken, and the computer put them together. What's behind it? The next room. <laughs> the next room with the ceiling, and we have some sort of writing here, red writing. And this writing is definitely not hieroglyphs. Cheops, the so-called constructor of the Great Pyramid, in his time, they had hieroglyphs. But these are not hieroglyphs. So it cannot be Cheops times. Something is wrong. That's the actual situation concerning this. But... There are more and more rooms in the Great Pyramid which we just found grace to modern technology. Some radar which looks through the stones. I told you before, there is a subterranean room which is called the unfinished room. We go down there, tourists are never allowed to go down there. Aha, uh -huh. first the imagination. How was the pyramid uh, uh, constructed? There are 20 theories. Every theory is possible. You could use ramps, four kilometers long. The ramps has more volume than the pyramid itself. Or you could construct a ramp around the pyramid. But it doesn't change nothing. The ramp around the pyramid has again more volume than the pyramid itself. You need more stones to construct the ramps than you need for the pyramids. <laughs> or there are all kinds of ropes. Everything is possible. You can exclude nothing. But ropes is technology. And there is not only an evolution in biology, there is evolution in technology. You have to know these things. You have first to test it, try it. You see, this man, Cheops, he comes from the Fourth Dynasty. His father, Snorfu, they were Stone Age people. So where is the evolution in technology to do all these things, to know all these things? You cannot exclude it, that they did it this way. But this is technology. All silly ideas have been produced, how the Great Pyramid were composited. And we don't know which of the ideas are true. But we all know you need technology, and you need evolution, and you need the planning. And it becomes more and more complicated. The three pyramids together, they are composited like the three main stars of the star of Orion. You see it, huh? the Orion belt, yes? Now the oldest god of Egypt 
was Osiris. But Osiris is the same as Orion. Even in hieroglyphic, you can always mix it. We had two little uh, uh, shafts. One points to the Orion, is Osiris, and one points to Isis. That's the goddess, and here it's Sirius. So it has to do with astronomy. You remember our solar system has three inner planets, means from the sun, Mercury, Venus, and the Earth. Inside the pyramid, we have three inner rooms. And the three inner rooms are at the same distances as the three inner planets seen from the sun. The Great Pyramid is not standing just by coincidence at the place. It is standing at the same place where the distance to the North Pole is the same as the distance to the center of the Earth. Now we have a little problem. Cheops, fourth dynasty, he should have constructed this building, but they didn't know nothing about Mercury, the inner planet. They could not know about the surface of the Earth, the distance between the inside and the North Pole. Why is it then in there? And it is a simple fact, it is in there. So. Then, some uh, 430 years before Christ, there was a Greek historian, his name is uh, Herodotus, you remember Herodotus. And he was there in Egypt for quite some years, and he was also inside the pyramid. And he has written in the second book of history that under the pyramid, beneath the pyramid, there is a lake, a sea. And in this lake, in this sea, there is a sarcophagus with the remains of the god of Osiris. Archaeology was laughing all the time. What is he talking about? about? About the lake under the pyramid. This is impossible. In the meantime, the lake was found. Okay. Yeah, just go inside. Yeah. I things next Okay. You enter this by the side of the pyramid. There is a hole, and from here you go down. Brings next to this shaft here. The shaft is large enough for two ladders. After 26 meters, you come to a subterranean room. This is this one. And out of the wall are seven niches. Only in two of the niches are sarcophaguses. This one is black basalt. Basalt is volcano. There are no volcanoes. This is granite. They told me when all this was discovered, the, the sarcophaguses was empty. I don't know if this is true or the next line. Then you go deeper from this point. You remember the shaft here was large enough for two ladders. Now we came to this shaft. It's much smaller. You have only room for one ladder. You came to a room which is now 52 meters under the Great Pyramid in the rock. And there is a lake. As Herodotus said. And inside the lake, you see here a sarcophagus. You see, we had to make these photographs through the water. That's why you cannot see clearly the sarcophagus, because all this is covered with water. Bring up next Here you see it again. Also, in this case, they told me that the sarcophagus was empty when they discovered it. I don't know if it's true or not. Huh? Ah, no. You see, of course, when we were down there, we measured this sarcophagus here. A large and, and long, long length. And this sarcophagus is bigger than the second shaft. Do you remember? There was one shaft with two letters. Then came the smaller shaft with one letter. This one is bigger than the smaller shaft with one letter, which means they cannot put this sarcophagus down the shaft. There must be other entries. So uh, the miracle continues. It's a never-ending story. 
in the meantime, thanks to modern uh, electronics, we know that there are at least four more shafts inside the pyramid and four more rooms. Now, if we know the situation, we know exactly where these rooms are. So the critics will ask, okay, if you know the situation, the, the exact place, why, why don't you go in there? You cannot. The shaft is only 20 centimeters on one side. That means not a human can climb in there. You need modern technology to go into these rooms. So the ones who made the planning, all these had to be planned before you start building the pyramid. This is engineering knowledge. And this planning knowledge does not fit together with Cheops. Cheops was the fourth uh, dynasty, more or less 2500 BC, or from now on, uh, four and a half thousand years back. At that time, the planning of engineering was not so advanced to plan the pyramid with all these shafts and rooms in there. And you have to plan it, uh, make it before you start building. And the other ways around, it's not possible. As I told you about Herodotus, he was in Egypt. In his second book of histories, he wrote that the priest in Thebes, Thebes is today's Luxor, they showed him 241 statues, one statue next to the other. And the high priest made a short commentary to every statue. Finally, the high priest said, said to Herodotus, these 241 statues represent 11,340 years. At that time, the gods from heaven were among the humans on earth. Since that time, the gods had not come back. So Herodotus, the Greek historian, made this statement two and a half thousand years from now on. And he speaks about 11,340 years. So from now on, we have to add two and a half thousand years. That me means altogether about 14,000 years ago, the gods from the sky were among the humans. Egypt is still full of mysteries, and all these mysteries have to do with the gods. We are still in Saqqara. Saqqara is about 20 kilometers from the Great Pyramid away. And you see this hole here in the ground in the desert. That was discovered in 1954. They, are, they found inscriptions with the name of the pharaoh Sechemhet. Sechemhet is the third dynasty. Before, I was talking about Cheops. Cheops is the fourth dynasty, so Sechemhet is older than Cheops, going back about 2700 BC. So inscription showed that this must be the tomb of Sechemet. Uh, the, 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 the door was sealed. There were no rubberies, nothing inside. And then they came to this gigantic sarcophagus. The sarcophagus is one block. Normally, you have a sarcophagus, and the sarcophagus has a lid up there, a cover. This sarcophagus had no lid, no cover. It had a gliding door. Like for animals, look at this. And up here, there were still the remains, the rest of flowers. That was there here. Somebody put the flowers here nearly 4,700 years ago. Now, this was opened for the first time in 1954, and the rest of flowers were still here. So they immediately put here a little cover on it so that the flowers would not be blown away. You see this here now. So slowly... This uh, gliding door was opened. And as I said, up there was a seal of Sechemhet, and the seal was closed. So everyone was sure inside there must be the mummy of the pharaoh Sechemhet. So they opened the gliding door, and inside it was completely empty. There was absolutely nothing in there. Now, how is this possible? 4,700 years ago, Someone chisels out a hole under the, the, in the rock of Saqqara, of today's Saqqara. They made this gigantic sarcophagus. That's, again, a fact of planning. You cannot chisel just a rock out of, of alabaster. You have to design it before with this gliding door. Then they seal it. They seal the subterranean chamber. 
they stay close the door and they seal the door. Somebody put a bunch of flour on it. And 4,700 years later, we come, the flowers are still there, the seals are still unbroken, but the sarcophagus is empty. How is this working? Again, 2,000 years ago, there were many historians, which you don't know probably. One of them is Diodore of Sicily. Of Sicily. He was also many years in Egypt. And he was writing in one of his books about the gods from heaven who have come down, who teach the humans. And he wrote, sometimes these gods died here. They had an accident. And they were put into sarcophaguses and closed. They had to wait until their brothers from space came to pick them out of the sarcophagus. And the priests were not allowed to talk about these sarcophaguses and these gods and bodies inside these things. So it might be that the gods, the extraterrestrials, returned. They took the body out of their, their friend or brother. They closed it again. And 4,700 years later, we come and we don't find a solution. How does this possible? All crazy. Now, this all has to do is all linked together. One of the well-known figures for me is the prophet of Enoch. Now, Enoch, if you read Enoch in the Bible, you read only two phrases of Enoch. It says that Enoch was the seventh patriarch before the great flood. So it started with Adam, with Seth, etc. Enoch was the seventh. And then Enoch disappeared in a fiery chariot into heaven. That's all what you read in the Bible. So if that's all, how do we know more about Enoch? In Ethiopia, there are old convents of old churches. And 165 years ago, a British man came to Ethiopia, and he was living for 30 years in one of these convents. And he learned the language perfectly. And in the old library, he found a book with the title, The Book of Enoch. He was astonished. He said, I know Enoch from the Bible, from two phrases. The Book of Enoch does not exist. So he translated the Book of Enoch. And there was an incredible story. Enoch is one of these fathers of us who wrote in the first person. That means an eyewitness. I did. I saw. I was there, etc., etc. So he says, by the way, if you want to find the book of Enoch, you cannot go to the bookshop and just ask for a book of Enoch. In German language, the book of Enoch is part of gigantic volumes, scientific volumes, the apocryphic texts, it says. And part of the apocryphic text is the book of Enoch. This German version was translated in 19, uh, 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 1900, 1900. So 170, 100 uh, yeah, years ago. <laughs> uh, uh, so. Now, what's so astonishing about Enoch? Enoch writes, it was evening and he was 12 years old. The community of the village wanted to sleep. And then they hear the noise in the sky. And they all go out of their tents and they saw a light, a fire in the sky. And they hear the lo a loud noise. Now, <coughs> something bright shining came down from the clouds. It was quiet and after a few minutes, two beings in glittering robes came closer to the society. They were all afraid and ran away. Except Enoch, he was 12 years old, he was standing there. And he was expecting what was coming. When these two beings came close to him, he was also afraid. And he fell down on his ground. After a few seconds, somebody picked him on his back and pushed him up on his feet. And now Enoch writes, There were two beings which I never saw on earth. They did not breed like humans. Never saw on earth. They had the form of humans. They did not breed like humans. They had some musk on their noses. Now, one of the two beings says to the young 12-year-old boy, Don't be afraid, human, son of the humans. Don't be afraid. We will do you nothing. The first question we have to ask, how is it possible that these extraterrestrials talk the language of Enoch? Some 14,000 years ago, 
extraterrestrials arrived on this planet. They behaved themselves like today's ethnologists would do. They studied a few tribes, they learned a few languages, and then they disappeared one day with the promise to return. Our ancestors at that time had no idea of technology. They believed erroneously that these beings from the sky were gods. We all know they had nothing to do with the real god. It was just extraterrestrials. So. Now, our ethnologists today, they go to the upper Amazon River, or they go and visit and study tribes on the Nile, and of course, none of these natives speak English or German or Spanish or French. It's always our ethnologists who learn the language of them very fast. In a few months, you know the language of them. And our scientists talk with the natives. So for me, it's no surprise if the extraterrestrials speak the language of the humans. They have studied before the tribe they want to study. So the language was absolutely no problem. So one of the two said to Enoch, don't be afraid, son of these men. A critic once attacked me and said, Eric, this has all nothing to do with extraterrestrial. It was God or an archangel of God who came down. I'm sorry, God knows everything. And this archangel would know too. They would know that the boy on the ground's name is Enoch. But they didn't know his name. They did not say, don't be afraid, Enoch. They say, don't be afraid, a human or man of this planet. They don't have his name. So Enoch is still afraid. Uh, uh, yeah, Enoch the young Enoch is still afraid. Afraid. Then they tell him if he wishes on his free will, he can go with them and they will teach him. And Enoch is proud and he says, "Yes, I go with them." So he goes a few steps with these two strange beings in their glittering clothes, and one of the two says to Enoch, "Son of man, you stink terribly." <laughs> so in their noses. We were stinking. I don't know what kind of clothes he had on. So Enoch has to take all his clothes off. And he has to wash himself. There was a river or something, a little lake there. He had to wash him completely. After he's washed and he stinks not anymore, some one of these two gives the young Enoch some sort of cream. And he says, put this cream all over your body, including your hair. Enoch does it. And then he smells on his body. And he said, oh, I smelled sweet, like ambrosia, and some other thing which we cannot translate. Then again, <coughs> these two, uh, one of the two uh, gives Enoch some clothes, the same glittering clothes which they own by themselves. So the young Enoch does not know what to do with the clothes. One of them shows him how to put the trousers on and the jacket. And when he's finished, Enoch, 12-year-old, looks down on his body, and he said, oh, I looked like one of them. Of course, now he's in the same garment. What, what else? So, then they go with him. Enoch says, they brought me to the place of fire. And we went up to heaven, to the sky. Of course, Enoch, he's a prehistoric man. This is before the great flood. He has no words of spaceship or something like this. He says, up there, I saw some glittering houses. They look like crystal. And the doors opened automatically, and the doors closed automatically. He was standing up there, and he was looking down. And he wrote, I wish to fall down to the earth. I saw the planet earth under me. Something was turning all the time, up and down and up and down. I saw the planet earth sometimes up, and then it was down. Then the stars were up, and the stars were down. When you are in a spaceship in an orbit around our planet, the spaceship always rotates on its own axis. This is a must because due to this rotation, you create a centrifugal force. And by the centrifugal force, you create inside the spaceship an artificial gravity. You have always ground under your feet. But Enoch, a Stone Age boy, could not know nothing about this. That's he say, once the Earth was up, the stars were down and otherwise. So he cannot describe it. Then doors open it. He comes into, it, in, into some uh, sort of plantations. He's, he describes strange fruits, strange vegetable, vegetable, which he has never seen on earth. Then they come into a round room, and in the center of the round room, there was a chair. He even describes it as a throne. And he says, on this throne, the Almighty was sitting. 
when they came into this round room, the two extraterrestrials and Enoch, all together three figures, they came in to the Almighty on the throne, on the chair, stands up and welcomes Enoch with shaking his hands. Now, what I just told you in the book of Enoch is my modern interpretation. When you read the book of Enoch in original, you will read another story. Why? Do I tell you a story? Do I mix it up? Now, again, the book of Enoch was translated the first time 165 years ago. <coughs> no. 165 years ago, there were no aircrafts on Earth. There were nothing like spaceship. It was all new knowledge. Our ancestors, the professors, absolutely integral and wonderful humans, they had to translate it in a religious way. They were asking, what is this? He obviously went up to heaven, to the sky. It must have to do with God and with angels. That's why we have the religious version of these old books. What I just told you about Enoch, in the religious version, it sounds like this. I say two extraterrestrials has come down from the sky. The religious version says two archangels have come down from the sky. Then one of them uh, uh, says to Enoch, you stink, human. Go to the water and wash yourself. In the religion version, it says this was the baptism of Enoch. Completely crazy. Before the great flood, you had no baptism. There was no Jesus Christ. So then uh, Enoch receives a sort of cream to put the, all the cream over his body. In my modern interpretation, he was simply disinfected. In the religious interpretation, well, he is... Gesalbt, as we saw, oh God. Huh? Anointed. anointed, anointed as a priest. How could a 12-year-old boy be anointed as a priest? It's all crazy. <laughs> then they bring him to the space, the space shuttle. The space shuttle brings him up to the mother spaceship. Enoch understands nothing. In the religious version, it says, now Enoch is brought up to heaven, to the sky. It was simply a shuttle flight from the earth to the mother spaceship. He stands up there and he sees the earth down and sometimes he sees the earth up because the mother spaceship is always rotating around its axis. He comes in this spaceship and he sees strange flowers, strange fruit, strange vegetable. He was simply in a sort of a, a plantage, a plantage, Pl plantage? Yeah. Garden. garden, okay. <laughs> because <laughs> in a mother spaceship, they need their own plantation. They need their own fruits and vegetable. It has nothing to do. The religious version says, now Enoch is in heaven and he crosses the paradise. He see the plants of the paradise. All nonsense. Then he comes, <laughs> he comes into the big room and there is a throne in the center and there the highest is sitting. In my opinion, he's just standing in the space command and he sees the commander of the spaceship. The religious version says, now Enoch is standing before the almighty God. But even the professors 160 years ago, they knew that something is wrong with their translation. If you imagine the real God, the real almighty God, whom I admire and pray, he would never stand up and go to the human and shake his hand and welcome him. <laughs> it has nothing to do with God. It was simply extraterrestrials. And we misinterpreted it. And we misunderstood this whole story. Because we'd always translated these old texts in a sense of religion and psychology. And that's wrong. We need new translation. As in Cheduana, as we have now slowly and slowly come into this thing. Now, Enoch even gives us the names of these extraterrestrials. By the way, he learns the language of them. After a few uh, months, he knows their language. And Enoch is sent down to the earth all the time to teach the humans in different belongings. And now he knows the language and he is teached in a scientific way. One of these teachers says to Enoch, human, look out of this window. You see this small little light there? You humans call it moon. 
but the moon has no light by its own. The moon receives his light from the sun. And then he explains him why the moon is sometimes full and half full and empty and all these things. So this is astronomy. The stranger explains to Enoch, you see this bright shining, you humans say sun to it. The sun is like the other little lights you see out there. They are all suns by its own. And over all the suns, some planets are circling. And then these extraterrestrials explains Enoch our calendar. He says, your planet Earth is surrounding this sun in 365 days plus. You see, we have a leak year, all four years. In Enoch, they give him leak hours, more precise. And now you have to think that all this happened before the great flood. Incredible. This is scientific knowledge before the great flood. So. And Enoch, of course, he knows the names of all of his teachers. And he gives the names. Yeah. Stop. You can see it here. Enoch chapter 8. And these are the names of their leaders. The name of the first is Jekun. He is the one who uh, selected the children of men. He huh? said, use the children. The name of the second, etc. So, ladies and gentlemen, we even know the names of the extraterrestrials. We know what these guys were. We know their profession. And the critics have absolutely no idea. The skeptics have no idea of these things. They are just talking and talking and talking rubbish. They know nothing. So. And not only this, Enoch knows the language of them, and then he understands that <coughs> these uh, extraterrestrials, they want to have sex with humans. And he again describes this. Look, Enoch chapter 6, verse 1 to 8. But when the sons of heaven saw that the daughters of men were fair, they admired them and desired to mate them, and etc., etc. Now, you could say sex with humans, extraterrestrial, sex with humans. This is all crazy. It must be fantasy. But we are educated in a Christian way, most of us. Just look at the Bible. The same thing. Control it this evening. First book of Moses, chapter 6, verse 8. When the humans began to multiply and have daughters, the sons of God, in some translations they translated the fallen angels, saw that the daughters were fair and they took them to wife. Why could they have sex with us? Because we are the offsprings of them. We have the same genes. They were here and we are similar to them. Also, every old holy text, including the Bible, says that God in singular or gods in plural, they created humans according their own image. We are the descendants of them. This, by the way, does not discredit evolution. You see, long, long time ago, this, the life forms, so to say, the DNA came flowing to our Earth, not by a spaceship. It simply happened because of the, the light of the sun and the, these little uh, uh, DNA molecules landed on Earth. And only now evolution started. That evolution has all kinds of form. On this planet, we have thousands and thousands of forms. We have maybe 100 or 200 forms of spiders, different forms of snakes and crocodiles and animals and all this. So why happened that only we? Because evolution has unchangeable forms. You have things in evolution, against them you can do nothing. For example, all of you know that dolphins are intelligent animals. So imagine the dolphins had a communication between them. And dolphins jump out of the water. And these dolphins would see little lights there, our stars. And these dolphins would be a scientific community, and they would meet together. And they would ask each other, hey, what are these lights out there? They have different colors and different distance from one to the other. And the boss of the dolphins, the, the top scientists, would say, okay, we need more information. So they jump and jump and bring more information of different lights up there. One day, among the dolphin community, they ask, are there maybe other suns up there? Other planets? Are there probably other planets with water, with dolphins like us? And sooner or later, the day arrives when they don't want to speculate anymore. They want to know it scientifically sure, absolutely sure. 
Now they have to construct a telescope. But to construct a telescope, you have to melt iron. To melt iron, you have to make fire. To make fire, you have to go out of the water. These are unchangeable forms. No living being which swims in the water would ever construct a computer. It's not possible. Unchangeable forms. We have animals like crocodile, crocodiles, or cats, but with their fingers or whatever this is, they could not construct these and these things. These are unchangeable forms. We all, we have a, in our brain a, a bestie, a beast, and the beast, you can do nothing against this beast. The beast's name is curiosity. <laughs> Just do something against curiosity. Curiosity means that finally, every intelligent form of life would make space travel. Why? Look, let's imagine, and that's now a science fiction story I tell you, let's imagine that our human scientists would find out everything, just everything. We would know for sure how man's brain work. We would develop telepathy. We would have made a hole throughout our planet. We know how it looks inside the planet. We, we know everything about plants and animals. Just imagine we know everything. But the lights are still up there in heaven. And because of the beast, curiosity, we have no alternative. We have to ask, and what the hell is this? <laughs> we will go there. We will find it out. We are part of this cosmic family. We are the offsprings of them. And it doesn't matter in evolution of the universe if it takes maybe, uh, I don't know, 10,000 years longer or not. We will go out ourselves and do scientific researches again, together then with the others. So anyhow, Enoch is up there. The day happens when the extraterrestrials, these uh, ethnologists, they have studied enough about our planet and they want to continue their trip. Now, some of these extraterrestrials have the interest now. And I talk, had sex with humans and it was not allowed to have sex with humans. So <coughs> that was a sort of mutiny on board. It was a sort of war in heaven. A group of extraterrestrials, they wanted to have sex with humans, but these were not allowed to do so. Now the point arrives where the mother spaceship disappears, and these mutinous were not allowed to come back on board. They had to stand on Earth. They did not continue with the mother spacecraft. So that's here. And so the mythology and the legends of all these gods started on Earth because these so-called gods, these uh, extraterrestrials, they took wives, they made children, so you have the sons of the gods in mythology. And mythology is something absolutely fascinating which without, within two, two generations you create. Look, this morning on the panel we were discussing could it be that our planet is destroyed one day be it by a natural catastrophe, a meteorite or whatever, or atomic blast, doesn't matter what. Imagine our planet would be destroyed, but a few humans would survive, maybe up in the Swiss Alps or in whatever. <laughs> and, <coughs> and imagine there are a few men and a few uh, women left. What would they do? A survivor of the war. They would save mankind. They would make sex. They would make children. Of course. Now imagine one day the father is here outside his hut and the boy is maybe three years old and he had the boy on his knees. And over the valley a gigantic mutated eagle flies. I say mutated. Our eagles, they have wings maybe of two meter. That mutated eagle had maybe wings of four meter. And the father says to his three-year-old son, boy, look up there. You see this eagle? In my time there were eagles much bigger than that eagle there. The, the eagle was empty. Inside the eagles, humans were sitting. There were little windows. The humans could look down on the earth. This eagle was flying over the big water, the ocean, uh, faster than an arrow. And the eagle arrived in a city where there were houses. They were so high that they scrapped on the sky. So the father is telling this story to his son. One day the father dies, and the son now becomes a father. And he has his three years old son on his knees. And again the story appeared, the eagle came up. 
Now the son would say to his son, you don't believe what your father said, so the grandfather. He said that once there were eagles which were empty, the body was empty, humans were sitting in there. There were little windows, they looked down, they saw the earth, they went faster than an arrow over the sea. They arrived onto a, in a city where they had skyscrapers. So the son is just a second generation, and the reality has become a legend. It goes very, very quick that the reality turns into a legend because the next generation cannot understand nothing anymore. Now they start writing, and they start misleading it, misguiding it, and so we have all these texts, a mixture of a reality which once existed. Have we some more questions? Okay, that's another miracle. In Argentina, exactly in Patagonia, in the department of Deseado, south of the small city Fitzroy, is a national park. This national park is called Monumento Natural Bosuves Petrificados. Because on this natural park, you find a lot of wood, trees, but these trees are petrified. And this, to petrify trees, this is a natural act. Within millions of years, it could happen absolutely that the trees become petrified. There is a scientific explanation of it. The problem is just some of these uh, trunks are cut like with the saw, are cut completely and in the same size. How is this possible? Millions of years ago, who used a saw? and cut the petrified rocks? We have no explanation of this. You all remember in ancient Egypt, the gods had their, um, how call it, ornament on their heads or crowns on their head, whatever it was. They all had something on their head. A few months ago, I was again in Peru, and in Peru, in the Museo Herrera, I found representations of the god of Viracocha. You see, it's all the same, be it in Egypt or be it in South America. They're also the same sort of gods, and they all showed it in their own way. Uh, yeah. okay. I just have to. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. We were misleading and we were misunderstanding the past. That's a normal process in scientific knowledge. And now we live in another generation. We have the knowledge of space travel, we have the knowledge of flying, and now we need new translations of these old texts. So again, the skeptics always say to me, come on, Eric, this is all rubbish. I mean, how should extraterrestrials, uh, how, should extra how should extraterrestrials make these distances? Every child know the distances are light years. It is not possible to, to uh, cover these light years. Of course it's possible. And I show you a primitive way. Everyone in this country knows the space shuttle. <laughs> With every shot up there, you have a, a payload of about 25 tons. So, now it is always a question of money. How many space shuttles you have in action? Today we have none in the United States. We use, we use the Russians one. But it's a question of money if you have four space shuttles or if you have 40 of them. When one day we have 40 of them, you would make a start and a landing into the orbit every week. And not every six months or so. Every week you would push up there uh, 25 tons of heavy load. These are prefabricated <coughs> parts. They are put together in an orbit around the Earth. And they create a spaceship. And the spaceship is round, has the form of a circle. And that's, again, a must. Because this circle you can turn around your own axis. As I said before, you create centrifugal force. And by the centrifugal force, you create an artificial gravity. Now, if such a gigantic spaceship would only reach 2% 2 of the speed of light. 2%, what's that, speed of light? they would reach the distance of 10 light years within 500 human years. Now you may say, this is crazy. Nobody survives 500 human years. 
You don't need to survive 500 human years. Just think, this thing is a generation spaceship. On board this spaceship, generation pass. They die, they birth, they die. Of course, you have wonderful restaurants up there, you have steakhouses, <laughs> you have Italian food. Maybe you find Swiss cheese fondue, so it's okay. <laughs> so it may take maybe 25 generations before you reach where 500 years have passed. Now, of course, on board here, they have modern astronomy. They know in advance which sun has planets and which planets have the same distance as our planet Earth. You see, we are not too close to the sun. It's not too hot here. We are not too far away. It's not too cold. So um, it, it's a wonderful situation. And until one year ago, we always believed that Earth is unique. Nowhere out there a planet has the right distance, not too hot and not too cold. In the meantime, because of the Hubble telescope and because of the calculation, we know that only in our Milky Way there are 4.5 billion planets Earth-like. 4.5, only in our Milky Way. So because of their astronomy, they know exactly which sun has planets in the right distance. So the mother spaceship can never make a landing. It just surrounds the planet. And now smaller vehicles go down from the mother spaceship to the new detected planet. We call this smaller vehicles spaceships or, or uh, space shuttles. The old Indians called them vimanas. In, uh, in the Egyptian text, they are called the flying wings. In the book of Ezekiel, they are called it the, the tenderness of God, and so on. Smaller vehicles go down to the planet. And now you give the crew who goes on the planet other 500 years to create the industry to build a second mother spaceship. Now, have in mind, they were 500 years on the way for a distance of 10 light years. Now you give them other 500 years, altogether 1,000 years, to create the industry for a new mother spaceship. Hey, 500 years, is this enough to create a spaceship, the technology? Our technology of today is a process of evolution of the past. Our forefathers, grandfathers, grand-grand-grandfathers, brilliant men, they always had to invent new things. You don't have just steel like this or electricity just like this. You have to invent all the kind. It's a process of evolution. The result is our industry. We have created our earth industry within the past 180 years. Now we give them 500 years to create the industry. And they have all their knowledge in their computer. They do not have to start from the beginning with evolution. They know it. So after 500 years, they have a second spaceship. And now it, it becomes intelligent, interesting. From Earth, one day a spaceship started. It was 500 years on the way. After 500 years, you have two, the old one and the new one. Each one is 500 years on the way. Then you have four, you have eight, you have 16, etc. Now a snowball effect starts to be. With only 2% of the speed of light, you would populate our whole Milky Way within 10 millions of years. And the only thing we on Earth had to do, at Bishwit was the first spaceship. That's all we had to do. So the skeptics say it is not possible to travel between the stars. This is nonsense. They have no idea. And now I was only talking about primitive technology, not about the speed of flight or over speed of flight or all these things of science fiction. But why should the, these extraterrestrials be like we? Be like humans? I mean, evolution or other planets, they develop completely different. I'm a, I have fantasy that I could imagine maybe on some planets there is something like flying elephants. <laughs> maybe they are beings with tentacles. And they are under the sea and on the air. All kind of things is possible out there. But there is this theory of panspermia. And what is panspermia? How does it function? There was the first intelligent form of life in our Milky Way. Now we can cry and say, stop. How did they start? We have no idea. Just give me a paper and I make a circle on this paper. 
And then I give this paper to each one of you. And I ask you the question, where did I start with the circle? Your intelligent would say, well, Eric had to start somewhere. But you cannot answer the question. A circle is close by itself, like the bull. So we don't know how it started. We just have to say somewhere it started. The first intelligence of life had an interest to spread out their own species. It is in a part of the universe. Now they start to send out billions of billions of DNA. DNA survives everything. This is a proven fact from the Zurich ETH University. It doesn't matter how, hot, how cold it is out there. DNA, these little things, you don't see them. They are just chains of molecule. They fly. And of course, the one who start with this game, they know that billions of DNA will just fall into a sun, into the gravity of a sun, and will be burned. Others of DNA will come into the gravity of a planet like our Jupiter, has no chance to grow up. A few of them will land on a planet which is similar than our planet. And now evolution starts. And as I said before, evolution has unchangeable forms. So it doesn't matter how many animals on this planet you have, how many insects, the unchangeable form will create us. But that's all in the program from the beginning. It does not contradict evolution. It's all, all together. Now, panspermia functions like this here. It starts... No, it has not... Oh, so, okay. <coughs> it starts from one point. It goes... And only millions of years later, the extraterrestrials know exactly on that and that and that planet, the message was growing. On other planets, it's not possible. So it was not coincidence when they arrived here. They knew exactly only this sort of planet has a change for our DNA. All the other planets have no change. So it's not coincidence they go to this planet. We are, by the way, in the similar situation. Imagine we would be able to make space travel in a far distance. Where would we go? Our scientists would sit together and say, okay, where, where do we go? We have the possibility. So start with our solar system. Will we go to Mercury? Forget it. It's 6,000 degrees hot. We will not go to Mercury. Will we go to Venus? Probably not. It's about 500 degrees on the surface. We are on Earth, the third planet. We can go to the moon. There we were already. We have to take our own atmosphere. We have to take our own atmosphere with us. We can go to Mars. This will be possible soon. We can go to some of the asteroids. The next planet after Mars is Jupiter. We will never go to Jupiter. Jupiter is a giant. Just the gravity of Jupiter would kill us. We don't have to do nothing on Jupiter. And outside, Pluto, etc., they are ice planets, cold. So we will take a choice from the beginning. Which planet is meaningful for a landing? We have a sort of grid uh, before we start. The same thing happened to the extraterrestrial. It was not coincidence that they arrived just here. That was on purpose. They knew it in advance. And now in our days, we have always people who have contact with extraterrestrials. We have contact with extraterrestrials. And then the critics again say, OK, you think you are chosen one. Why are you something special than the rest of the, of the planet? It's again wrong thinking. In the place I live in Switzerland, I live in the mountain. And we have big of these ant hills with these big black ants. One day I was standing before one of these ant hills and I said to myself, what happened if I very carefully would take just one little animal into a glass? I bring this animal at my home table, I push it on the table, I photograph it from every side, I put this animal back in the glass, not hurting it, not doing them harm anyhow, bring it back to the same anthill and put it in the anthill again. Now this ant would run around the anthill, now there are billions of other ants, and say, I was abducted by an, <laughs> by an ex-ant intelligence. So, of course, now, this poor ant would land in the madhouse of the anthill. <laughs> and if the ant had some friends, some good friends who would listen to them, the friends would say, but what do you think? Are you chosen? Are you something special? Why would they check just you? I'm sorry, it was just a coincidence. I took one of the millions out of the anthill. 
That's all. We have to think it differently. So uh, from time to time, I also one of these humans which receive secrets. Some people send me secrets, and in most of the cases, they say, Eric, here, I give you something in archaeology. I'm an archaeologist, retired now. Please do not tell my name to the public. They do not want that I was the source of it. But you are allowed to publish it. A few months ago, I received a, a video from a fighter pilot, an aircraft pilot of Puerto Rico. No, Costa Rica, Puerto Rico. I show you this. You are intelligent enough to realize by yourself what it is. It's taken by the front camera of a fighter, air fighter, a pilot over Costa Rica. Look, uh, Puerto Rico. Look at this yourself. I don't have to make any comment on it. All the inscription around here gives the exact dates, the exact uh, the geographic location, changing every tenth of the second. You have the object in the center here. It gives the distance to the object. The object changes all the time. Sometimes it's a little bigger, a little smaller. It flies first over different fields. Then it flies over an air, uh, uh, airfield, an airport. Next to the airport <coughs> came a harbor with ships. And you will see it. The object sinks into the water. After a short time, it, is a, it, it appears again out of the water. And now it's not only one anymore, it's a two. And it's all proven by these facts which change every tenth of the second. No one can deny this. So what do we do? Always saying this is not true. This is just a hoax. I'm sorry, this is our reality. Some thousands of years ago, these extraterrestrials were here. Before they left our planet, they promised to our forefathers, we will return in the far future. This promise of return is a reality and was a reality with every tribe of the past. For example, when Francisco Pizarro, Pizarro was the conqueror of today's Peru. <coughs> when he, for the first time, landed in Peru, the Indios believed that he was the long-waited or expected God. When uh, <coughs> uh, Hernando Cortes came to Central America with the Aztecs, the same situation, the leader of the Aztecs, Moctezuma, he fell down to the ground. He believed that Cortes is the long-expected God. The same thing with James Cook in the South Sea. They all, the natives, always believed in the beginning, now the gods have returned. So this believing of returning of somebody is not a Christian invention. It existed long before Christianity. And what do we have today? I am educated as a Catholic. <laughs> we Christians, we wait the return of Jesus. But we know that the Muslim society is waiting the return of their Mahadi. We know that the Buddhist society is waiting for the return of their Buddha. We know that the Jewish society is waiting for the returning of their Messiah. Now, honestly, not every religion can be right. Some of them must be wrong. What about if all of them are wrong? There is neither Jesus, neither Jesus nor Buddha, nor Mahdi, nor Messiah returning, simply the extraterrestrials. They promised it to our forefathers, and it is handed down in the holy book. Before Enoch disappeared on this planet, he went again back to his family. And his son is Methuselah. And Enoch has written many books dictated by the extraterrestrials on board. And he gives these books to his son, Methuselah, and says to his son, Methuselah, keep all these books for the generations after the great flood. Methuselah asked his father, Enoch, Father, will we see us again? And Enoch says, no, we will not see us again. The, the guardians of the sky told me thousands of years will have passed before I came back to this planet. Now, 
Old Arabian inscriptions say that the Great Pyramid was not constructed by the pharaoh of Cheops, 4th dynasty. For example, Ibrahim Abdul al Udi, an Arabian historian, says the Great Pyramid was constructed before the Great Flood by a ruler with the name of Saurit. And they precisely say Saurit is the same figure which the Hebrew call Enoch. Today, we find in the Great Pyramid shafts and rooms. We cannot grab in there because they are too small, these shafts. I told you the planning is so scientifically made that it must be high society. And these planners, these engineers of the past, they knew exactly only a high society, technological civilization, is able to go into these rooms. A primitive society, hundreds of years ago, had no technological instruments to go into these shafts. And now they say, it was not Cheops, it was Enoch who constructed the Great, Great Pyramid. And Enoch gave all his books to his son Methuselah for the generations after the Great Flood. I'm sure within the next decade, we will find in the Great Pyramid rooms with writings. And what are we doing then? They are just here, and we cannot talk them away anymore. So this is what I call, then we have the shock of the gods. We do not understand everything anymore. <coughs> That's why I think it makes more sense, and this is more responsible, to be prepared for this event of returning of the god than to be shocked. And as the ufologists here know, probably they are back again. See that UFO movie you just saw. <laughs> they are observing us. They are learning, learning our languages again. They are studying us. They want to be prepared for communication, etc. But, <laughs> but they don't want to shock us. They know how our brain functions. They know exactly because we are the offsprings of them. They know if they would show them just before a big football stadium. Okay, all the cameras are here. But mankind is shocked completely. Billions of people, especially in the Arabian world, they would kill themselves. It makes no sense to live anymore. Religion told us all nonsense. It's all not true. So <coughs> the preparation is slowly, not in a shock way. Slowly, slowly, this society should be prepared. We are back again. Don't be afraid of us. There is a way of communication and the way of peace between these beings and us. And that's why, ladies and gentlemen, I do my job. I do it to prepare you. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Yes, thank you. That's incredible. I really appreciate yes, it. Thank you. Okay. Yeah.